Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, visitors of all ages. Um, welcome to the Getty Villa, both in person and on Zoom. Uh, you're, today, you're really in for a treat uh, with our presentation by metalsmith Adam Whitney. Uh, I'm Kenneth Lapotten, Curator of Antiquities here at the Getty Villa. It's my great, great pleasure to welcome back to the Getty Villa Adam Whitney, whom I first met at Harvard University in 2018 in the context of an exhibition they had there on uh, animal-shaped vessels from antiquity. And it was in the context of a very scholarly symposium that Adam was, uh, you might say, the odd man out because he wasn't a curator or a professor or an arts historian. He is a maker. He does things with his hands. And as you'll see in this lecture, he does them with great skill and enthusiasm. And it's his insights that have been gained through years of practice into how metal vessels were made in the ancient world, which inspired us to bring him here to the Getty Villa. First, uh, earlier this spring for a workshop uh, with scholars and now for a series of public programs where he can share his knowledge as this program we're doing today is in conjunction with the exhibition we have on show until August 8th, Persia, ancient Iran and the classical world, which features a number of ancient uh, animal-shaped metal vessels. Uh, Adam Whitney is currently a resident artist at the Penland School of Craft in North Carolina. And as I said, his studio practice focuses on the traditional techniques of raising metal, repoussé, and chasing. And he's inspired throughout his practice by the silver worth of antiquity and is striving to understand and parallel those projects. He received his BFA in Crafts and Material Studies from the Virginia Commonwealth University and has taught widely both in the United States and abroad and teaches not only entire classes but short, shorter term workshops uh, to really spread not only his passion for his craft but try to make people understand it and revive the craft. So it's with great pleasure and personal anticipation and gratitude that I'd like you to join me in welcoming Adam Whitney to the podium. Adam. I'd like to first thank the Getty for having me out again to be able to share uh, my interest in metalworking and teaching. I'm gonna bring you on a journey of how I made this piece. This is my EMU Riton, and this is based off of historical Ritons. But first, I'd like to thank the Lee Valve Company for acquiring this piece and for supporting artists by collecting artwork. This piece will also be on view at the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina. So if you're there, please stop by and see it. It'll be on uh, display for the next year, so until July 2023. As Kenneth said, I am uh, currently a resident and artist, uh, artist in residency at Penland School of Craft. These are the barns, the studios. On the right is the studio building, which I share with eight other artists. And my studio is the shack in the back. So if you follow this little red arrow, <laughs> you go to the back side of it. They decided to put me there because I make a lot of noise. I hammer all day, every day. So to be kind to my neighbors, put me in the shack in the back. Um, the residency provides a living and studio space for three years, but you're required to bring all your own equipment. So everything you see in the studio, I brought with me and set up. That makes the residency so important to be three years long because I can't move all this equipment for a short amount of time. And also the duration of my work now, projects extend well past a year to make the project. 
I've been a metalsmith for over 20 years, but it's only been the past seven years that I've primarily focused on the two techniques of raising and chasing and repousse. I've done a lot of other work from jewelry, bench work, resizing rings, diamond setting, gold work, architectural iron work, enameling work, and I've taught all of that elsewhere as well. The desire to make this work is very important to me. I love the fact that it is traditional, going back over 2,000 years, and that it really requires no power tools at all. These historical writer, and these are in the Getty, so if you haven't seen the show, please go over and look at them. And even if you've seen them once, I hope after this talk you'll go back and take a closer look at them to understand the complexity of what the metalsmiths did over 2,000 years ago to make these objects. And there's four. Um, I'm very happy that I was invited in March to come out and actually handle these objects. As a maker, to be able to touch something that is this old, I can understand so much more. My fingers see in a way that my eyes don't. I can feel thicknesses of metal, and I know how that metalsmith hammered the object and what they were thinking while they were creating it. So a little bit about a riton. A riton is formed in two parts, and it's connected by a mechanical joint, and this is usually a tension fit joint. So a mechanical joint is one that isn't uh, glued or soldered using heat. This is the horn-shaped beaker. I just refer to this as the horn, and I'll continue referring to it as the horn throughout the presentation. And then the four-part, or the protome. So in antiquity, these usually took the form of animals, uh, usually four-legged animals, stags, cats, uh, sometimes a centaur or two, which there's also two beautiful ritons. Um, well, one that has the centaur, uh, and then the other one is a horse. Go visit that as well. In this riton, the whole back of the horn is decorated with low relief chasing and repousse. So chasing is a technique of kind of adding ornamentation to the surface of the metal without removing any metal. Sometimes people confuse this with engraving, but engraving is actually cutting away and removing parts of that metal. So think of chasing repousse as just displacing metal in different areas to create form, and you can also get this nice volume as well. The forepart of the riton has pieces that are fabricated onto it, and those are the horns and the ears. Through x-rays, we can see how those are fabricated on, but we can also see evidence of solder seams. So the forepart of this leg is cast, and then you can see a little bit of a solder seam there. And then above that leg, above that solder seam, that would all be a raised object. So raised objects all come from a flat sheet of metal, and they're hammered into the shape over time. All Raita have this hole in them, and that makes it a flowing vessel. So when this is filled with liquid, the liquid will continue to flow out of that hole. You'd either have to plug that with your finger or maybe something else to stop that from coming out. So it's a very strange drinking vessel. We get a sense of how it was used from images like this uh, fresco. And this individual is holding it up. You can't really tell if anything is in his hand, but it looks like he's drinking uh, straight into his mouth from it. So the wine is being poured out from the rita into his mouth. Um, here we have this wonderful low relief uh, stone painted picture depicting silversmiths. And I love this because this is exactly what I still do. Nothing about this has really changed. And I'm gonna do a side-by-side -side comparison. There's one step that I don't do anymore, and that's this first one. So in the illustration, we see two metalsmiths working together to hot forge what's probably an ingot of metal. So the top left picture is an ingot of fine silver that I poured. And 
I like to say I did that for research, but this picture is pretty old, and I did that because I couldn't afford sheet. So I was trying to save a little bit of money by recycling old projects, melting them down, and then I hot forged the object solo. We have a good understanding that it's being hot forged because the smith on the far right is holding a set of tongs. So he's holding that ingot while the other smith strikes. And what they're doing is just forging this piece of silver out into a thin sheet. There's a level where you cannot continue hot forging because you need mass to hot forge something. When the sheet gets thin enough, you can heat it up, and by the time you bring it over to the anvil or maybe the rock that they're hammering on, the sheet will dissipate the heat very quickly. So at that point, you need to switch over to typical raising techniques. I do not do this anymore. I buy sheet and it comes nice and flat and it comes in a circle and it's very quick and easy on my shoulder. In this illustration, we see a smith angle raising. So there's a form underneath the bowl and he's striking it with what looks like a brick. Um, here, I'm hammering over a raising stake. So the biggest difference maybe in technology is the fact that I have steel. Tool steel I use to help hammer. So all my hammers are tool steel. The raising stakes are usually cast or mild steel. Um, in antiquity, they may have had brass, bronze, wood, bone, all sorts of stuff can be hammered over. It's just how much force can you put into the work or that hammer blow. Chasing and repose. Um, here we have a whole team of smiths. And this may be the biggest difference. I work alone. I'm the only one in my shop and I need to do every step of what we just looked at besides buying the sheet. You know, in a workshop from antiquity, I'm sure there was multiple people working in it in multiple ages, where you had the master training younger apprentices, all the way down to probably the youngest person in there may have just been a couple years old, running around picking up tools or handing stuff to somebody else. I would love for that to be able to have in my studio. Um, I do everything solo. And like I said before, these tools uh, I'm chasing here with a steel tool that I make, and after we can take a closer look at them. But the material that's holding that work is pitch. And that pitch is exactly the same that they may have used thousands of years ago as well. There hasn't really been a new innovation and a material that holds metal and allows it to give a little bit so we can decorate it with this chasing and repose process. At the core of all metalwork is this very unique ability to anneal metal. Annealing is a process of heating it up. Each metal has a specific annealing temperature. We do not measure that temperature with any device. We have to train our eyes to be able to see it. This is a fine silver pitcher and I'm heating it with a propane torch. You could heat it in a kiln or in an oven or a forge. As long as you have high heat, uh, you're annealing the piece. This is done in the dark so you can see how the color changes. And as soon as you turn on the lights, it doesn't even look like it's hot at all. So silver is very tricky to anneal and its annealing temperature is also very close to the melting temperature. So when you're working on stuff that's complex, you may have a lot of variation and wall thickness. That means those thinnest spots may want to melt on you faster than those thicker spots. And it's important to be very cautious about that annealing step. Here I have that same picture. So when it's annealed, the metal is extremely soft. You can see I'm just crushing it with my hands. Metal also goes through this process called work hardening. So as soon as I start crushing, bending, or hammering it, it work hardens the metal. The annealing relaxes the crystalline structure of the metal, allowing metal to bend. Work hardening compresses the crystalline structure, making it more rigid and firm. This is just a very quick sped up clip of me hammering it, but you can tell it does not take much. If I'm too aggressive with hammering metal, 
bad things can happen. Edge cracks are the most common. So this was done deliberately. Um, and it can be done through aggressive hammering in the raising process. But it could also be done through improper annealing and maybe overheating. And this was the same ingot that I had poured and hammered out. That flaw in the metal could go all the way back to when the metal was liquid in form and a little tiny inclusion could have been in with the silver or when I poured it into the ingot mold, there could have been a bubble of air right there. There's a lot of steps in this process where there could be a flaw in the metal and you don't exactly know when or where, but you need to be cautious while you work and keep an eye out for all these small little details. This is another uh, usually cause from overheating where it's like surface cracking. And this could also be caused from underheating. So maybe that little area wasn't annealed properly and then I went to hammer it and the rest of it was annealed properly. So that annealing step is really at the core of all metal smithing techniques. To determine your starting size to make a raising, we use a pretty vague formula. It's pretty simple as well. It's just width plus height equals the disc diameter. So that works for either a cup or a bowl. Here we have, say, five inches wide by two inches tall. So that starting disc would be seven inches. And the same thing for a cup as well. If we want it at five inches tall and two inches wide, which would be a really narrow cup, you wouldn't want that. But you'd start off with a seven inch disc. Laying out that disc, you know, laying out any circle, you usually find center and then using a compass or a pair of dividers, you make a circle. Uh, raising usually starts by using that center point, but I like to refer to that center point as a kernel because sometimes when I make my work and you'll see later on, I shift that center point. So I'm moving it. It doesn't live in the center anymore because I need to allocate a certain amount of mass either to the front or maybe to the sides. So now I call that point the kernel and I can put it anywhere on that disc. That kernel helps me take measurements and control the raising throughout the whole process. Here's a simple bowl that I'm gonna bring you through the whole process of making. And just to give you an idea of how that uh, equation works out, I buy my sheet mainly from the UK, so it comes in millimeters. So sometimes it doesn't always translate perfectly to standard. So this was 12.2 inches in diameter, the starting disc. After I hammered, the form is eight and a quarter wide, and it's about four inches tall. So somehow we increased the size of that disc a little bit. I'm gonna show you the process that the raising goes through in all these rounds. And you'll understand that it goes through a lot of movement. The metal is going to change on you. The raising rounds start when the metal is soft and annealed. I hammer all the way from kind of the center towards the edge, and then it's work hardened. I need to stop, that's one round. I re-anneal it, and I do the process again, that's two rounds. So this bowl, took 11 rounds of annealing and raising to complete. This is a Dutch raising technique. I use three different techniques in the majority of my work. And this just means that I'm leaving the bottom much larger than normal and more flat and just trying to get the walls to come up quicker. When I draw these concentric circles from the kernel, I have these rows that I hammer in. That row, or course, think of it as every hammer blow I put down in that row is like laying down a course of bricks. And I need to slowly build up to raise the wall up higher. Round six, what I've done is I've stopped at every row or course of hammering and photographed the work. So you can start to really see how the diameter of this disc is being reduced. As we reduce that diameter, there's extra material and that begins to scallop. So towards the bottom, you can really see how that's scalloping. At that point, I have the ability, depending on how I hammer, 
to either thicken that wall, so that wall will grow in thickness from the um, 20 gauge, which is 0.8 millimeters, to maybe one millimeter, or I can push it up to raise the wall taller. And that is the raising process. The equation to determine the starting disc size is really only a guide. If I give the same diameter disc to different people, they're all going to raise a different size object based on the way they hammer. And this happens when I teach students often. So here we're looking at three copper cups. They all started off as a six inch diameter, so they all have the same weight to them. And I raised them with different hammering patterns. So one, I intentionally shrunk it. You can see that it is shorter in height, but the wall thickness is slightly larger. The one in the middle is perfect, hopefully. And then the last one is stretched taller. So being aware of how you're hammering determines how you can make more elaborate pieces of work. I use copper with all my prototyping and a lot of my samples because it's a lot cheaper than silver. And I can make mistakes in it and I don't need to worry that much. It does work slightly different, but every metal works different. Silver also has a lot of different alloys. So these four Seamonster stirrup cups um, that I made over a three year period are all made out of fine silver. So that's pure silver, we call it three nines fine. It is the softest metal that I work with. I'm able to control that with the most versatility. I can thin it out, I can thicken it very quickly, and I can also raise fast in it. I also use a lot of Britannia silver, which is an alloy of silver. So it's 95.8% silver, fine silver, and then 4.2% copper is added to that. So an alloy is two or more metals combined, and that makes the metal more durable, but also stiffer. So if I'm to make the same object in fine silver and in Britannia silver, the Britannia will take a little bit longer, maybe 10%. We're accustomed to sterling silver in the United States, which is 92.5% silver and then 7.5% copper. This is a much uh, more durable silver. It's better for jewelry and tableware, but it's very stiff to hammer. I barely use this anymore. Um, if I made any of these stirrup cups out of sterling silver, it would probably take twice as long for me to produce one of these cups. And those cups take anywhere between 100 and 150 hours. So just that stiffness in metal would increase the hammering time. It also increases the risk of cracking and having problems occur to the surface of the metal. Coin silver is something I'd never even try to hammer, but they made coins out of it because it's extremely durable. So 90% silver, 10% copper. Now, making an EMU right on, and EMU is short for extravehicular mobility unit. It's just the acronym that NASA uses for the spacesuit. But I also like to think of it because it's not just a suit that you put on, it is kind of a tiny little spaceship that one body fits in, which is an amazing idea. But research is the major component to my work. And I wish I had enough time to act on even half the ideas I generate. But working in this process and these techniques is extremely time intensive. So I need to take my time and really think out a project before I just jump into it and begin making it. I've always wanted to make a right on. And it took me, I think it was about 17 years of being a metalsmith until I felt like I was ready that I could take on that project. When I thought about it, it was 2019, and it took me a year of just thinking about what the four part would be. I went through a list and I bugged all my friends, asking them what they thought would be cool at the end of a write-on and they didn't even know what a write-on was. So it was a really short conversation, but it took a while, a lot of research. It needed to be something that um, was important to me, first of all, that could also be made with these techniques and really situated in the time that we're in now and I also think about looking at these pieces that are 2,000 years old. There's a lot of animals, but 
what if somebody looked at my rights on 2,000 years from now? And what would they reflect on that? When I start actually hammering on metal, I don't know where to start at all. I'm clueless. Uh, I don't know anybody else in the United States who's made one of these. I don't know anybody else outside of the United States that has tried. I'm sure there is somebody, and if you're out there, please give me a call. I'd so many questions I want to talk to you about. So the way I start is prototyping. I take copper and I kind of just jump in with the best idea. The, the first thing I need to figure out is the disc size and shape. So if I'm able to get numbers from historical work, I can kind of get an understanding of how much volume is in that piece and I can kind of get a rough idea of how large that sheet should be. That sheet, maybe if it's a thin sheet, will be probably larger in diameter, but then I need to decide if I'm going to use a thinner or a thicker sheet and a smaller diameter. So that volume is still present either way. Uh, this first horn prototype, I did an oval, and that was just a really bad idea, really quick. But I had to start somewhere and I had to try something. Uh, the second prototype, I switched over to a circle. So and I felt like this 20 gauge material was working well. It's a 15 inch diameter. That's just a really random size that I thought would work well. And after I got done finishing that, I just knew the scale that that left me was a little smaller than I wanted. So then the next one, I'm making a minor adjustment. Uh, I also changed the hammering style. That way I started the raising. This um, in Horn Prototype 3, the starting disc is crimp raised. So I'm putting these flutes or scallops into the work before I start hammering on it. I like this technique because it's very quick and I was hoping I could save some time because I've already you know, been banging away for a while and not making progress. But it wasn't the best way to form this horn. It works a lot better for bowls or cups or simple objects. When I change that diameter size, you gotta be really careful because it adds a lot of volume to that disc. You've gotta think about that circumference and just adding a quarter of an inch adds a lot of material and a lot of weight. The fourth uh, horn prototype, I really felt like I had the right size. I went to a 16 and a half inch disc and I was moving the kernel around a little bit so I could get more volume where it was needed. But the biggest problem I ran into was you can see this black line at the top of it. I needed the top of this horn to be even or in line with the top of the bottom part where the forepart would go into. So just looking at that, you can see the front part, there's more copper. I need to now figure out how to hammer that so it goes to the back. And that was the next process. Throughout this whole prototyping process, I uh, document my work and I usually use my phone for the prototypes and then I can put everything into albums. So just this, uh, I think it was prototype five, I believe there was 259 images in my phone. And when I wake up at 3 a.m. freaking out about the project, this is what I pull up and I start looking at pictures of raisings and I try to figure out what I did in the past and what I need to do for the next piece and where I may have made a mistake. Um, and I'm constantly putting the pieces together to compare and contrast. The hardest issue I had with my horn that was a lot different from any uh, horn in antiquity was I'm using a human figure. It's not a four-legged animal. So you can see where the fore part is kind of horizontal to the horn but mine needed the upright without having a horizontal body. It's a vertical body. So I had to extend this horn kind of back up and that was troublesome. Figuring out how to get enough material to stay there. There was times where I over thinned the material as well. So if I stuck the protome into it, it would flex too much and it wouldn't hold it properly because the metal was not stiff enough. Horn five, I made some corrections, so I offset that kernel about an inch and a half to the front. So I'm really adding a lot of mass to the back of this work, and I'm barely hammering the front. And what I'm doing is trying to get the copper to go back underneath that kernel 
all the way back around to form that horn shape. And you can see I label everything. So if it has a red circle around the number, that's the sample that I'm on or the prototype. And then the other number is how many rounds of hammering. So that's 53 rounds of annealing and hammering to get to that point. And once again, you know, all these prototypes are meant to get to a spot where they basically fail and where I know that it wasn't working correctly and then I make an adjustment until I feel comfortable that I can start working in the silver. When I start working in silver, I photograph the work in a more controlled environment with a much better camera than my phone. And here I'm documenting each row of hammering on five rounds, so you just saw that happen here as well. You can really see that ripple of metal move down and be pushed to the edge, growing the height. I can also thicken the metal, so I'm being very cautious of where I'm thickening um, parts of this horn because later I'm going to fill it with pitch and do a chasing round, which is adding detail and ornamentation to it. The same time I'm working on the horn, I'm also doing prototypes for the EMU suit. And it, it really switches back and forth. It depends on how I'm feeling. Uh, you know, if I felt like I had a prototype that was really successful in one, then I'll continue. Sometimes I just get fed up with it, so I switch over to something else. But with the suit prototype, it's a much smaller disc, so it works a little bit faster. But what I needed to do is figure out how to pull up enough material to where the arms are and then push them out. So what I'm doing here is actually kind of piling up a thickness of metal. You can see uh, number four has circles. Those circles are where I'm thickening the metal. So this metal starts off as one millimeter. Before I start stretching it, those circles will probably be close to two millimeters thick. And that's all through just hammering processes. I then stretch out those arms as I also shrink in underneath the arms. This took a lot of prototyping once again, we won't go through all of them, but I felt like by the fourth one, I had a good idea of what I was doing and I was confident that I could get those arms to go out and I just wasn't getting them to go out like weird straight kind of cartoon arms. I was getting dynamic uh, changes with the elbow and movement as well. But here you can see the bottom middle picture um, there's a big fail written on it. I'm kind of hard with myself and my samples sometimes. And that's pointing to a ripped section. So I realized that I thinned out the metal too much in that spot. So the next one I need to be aware of that and try to push more material to that area so it's thicker. Um, there's also two spots where there's solder and that's where it cracked at the edge. But I continued to solder it just to figure out other things with that piece. Prototypes five, six, and seven. So five and six, I was really getting a hang of it. I felt like I was going in the right direction, but I'm just trying to resolve how to make kind of a torso and a head and arms. I'm not even thinking about design at this point. And one of the troubles I get into is how I hold this work. So I had to go through a lot of different ways to hold on to it. And this is clay in a pitch pot. And I ended up using different clay but I still use that technique to hold work that's more elaborate. Prototype six, I really felt good, and that was all in my old studio back in Vermont. So when I moved to North Carolina, I had to pack up my whole studio and then set it back up at a new location, and I was so excited, I jumped into prototype seven, and it went horrible. Very quickly did I ruin it, but it was really nice because I can tell that's round 14. When I saw that problem occur, I knew it happened with another prototype. So I was able to stop myself and be like, we just need to take a break, walk away from this, do something else. And while I was doing all of this work, you know, not all prototypes are failures that I don't create into a finished piece. So these are more interesting prototypes and samples where I'm thinking more about the design of the helmet. I cannot 
take each little figure and think about the design while also trying to push the limits of the material to make arms. So I'll do larger pieces to just figure out what looks good for a helmet and what I'm interested in in those designs. And what I really found out was this is one in silver, and this also became a sample to do all the gold gilding on it as well. I hadn't done a lot of gold gilding, and I knew it was going to be very important that I get it right. So doing this whole visor was a good time to practice. But with this helmet cup, I start off actually as like a rectangular raising, so it's a square raising technique, and that's so I can establish enough mass on the two sides of the helmet because I need to undercut where those cameras and lights are. So once again, this is just another project that's teaching me how to move material correctly. And this one in particular, you know, the mass of that starting disc is the same weight as the final form. So it's a sculpting process that I'm not adding material like modeling clay and I'm not subtracting material like carving. I'm just reshaping all of that mass. After all that, I got back to the eighth and final prototype for the EMU suit, and I felt much more confident about this. I had a good understanding of what I needed to do. I liked the design of it. I started cutting open its arms so I could fit prototype hands, and I also was able to stick it onto a horn to see how well that tension fit was and if it leaked or not. And that was disappointing because it leaked. And it was just yet another problem I had to solve. Here's the silver EMU torso and figure. I really like seeing those arms form up and the nice arrows I put on, pushing one hand up and the other down. Here you'll also see I took a lot of notes. I was writing pitch on the work. I'm trying to do that more so I know when the pitch was put in and what round I used pitch inside of it. So. This is just a couple of pictures of what pitch is. It's this goop that's coming out of the hands. Um, and that is uh, melted into the work. It takes the shape of any vessel that it's in, and then it's removed after the round of hammering. So here's a quick sped up version of me removing it. I heat it with a torch. Um, this can be dangerous. You need to know exactly what you're doing and be careful and you'll start seeing it squirt out of that hole and kind of come out from underneath. I'll just grab it with a special glove and pick it up. And I didn't film it all, but after that, I start wiping out the pitch with spatulas, anything that I can get inside of it. And then I clean it with paper towels and then I clean it with acetone. I don't burn any of my pitch out with a torch. I want it nice and clean so I can look at the surface of that metal. The gold gilding, I use the diffusion bonding technique. So uh, it's with 23 to 24 karat fine uh, gold, and I, I can only do it on top of fine silver. So I have to heat up the fine silver to about five to 700 degrees and then burnish it on. And I'm here I'm using an agate burnisher, and that just helps so I don't transmit heat up the tool. It's a very long, lengthy process, and you can see I was cutting kind of uh, pizza slices to be able to form on that convex surface. So here are the two pieces finished and they're separate right now. The solution I found to put them together was just a little bit of orthodontist wax. I figured that was food safe. I put a little on the base of the protome and slid it in place and that sealed up any little cracks that were between the horn and that forepart and made it watertight. It holds about a liter of wine. So that's the polite way to pour it, but there's also the party style as well. <laughs> this takes a little practice.
But if you have it, you have to give it a shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I continue using the EMU suit to make work based on, and this is just a little glimpse of my latest project. It was a glove a goblet. And if you'd like to check out more of that process, please follow me on Instagram, where I'm posting a lot more of the process images. Thank you. much, Adam, for such an illuminating presentation. As I saw when we visited the ancient Roman silver mm. exhibition that we had here at the villa in New York, and we visited it together, and you were constantly seeing things and observing things in the ancient silver and with eyes, you know, so different because of your experience. This has, too, been so illuminating and you've allowed us to kind of bridge that, that, that gap between the ancient work and the modern work, although obviously your, your imagery is very modern, <laughs> your techniques are, are very ancient. Um, I have several questions myself, there are questions on, on the Zoom, but I wanna invite those of you in the audience that have questions also to please approach either microphone uh, to ask them but I'll, I'll, I'll start with one early on when you're talking about annealing, you, you talked about this, this, this cracking that takes place. And of course, in archeological objects, we see a lot of cracking, damage, and splitting. And I think I've always attributed that just to you know, age and process and mm -hmm. deposition and, and whatever. Do you think there's, mm -hmm. can you think of a way to distinguish the kind of metallurgical or you know, cracking in the workshop from crackling through, through time? And I, I don't know if there is or not, but that was one question that occurred to me. I think it's really difficult, especially with pieces that are so old. But the thing is, that crack, even if you can't see it when I finish it, there may be work that already has a crack in it that will reveal itself you know, in 20 years, in 100 years, and who knows what it's gonna happen thousand years and whatever condition that it's in. So if it's in an atmosphere that's kind of corrosive, that corrosive atmosphere is going to find that crack first. And then it's going to start eating away in there before anywhere else. So it's going to just make it more emphasized. Great. Thank you. We have, we have a question here in the auditorium, please. Um, yeah, I just have a quick question also about the cracks. Um, I was wondering, is there a specific, um, because I know that you said that uh, like the silver, there's like the stress crack and the other cracks. When you, and also how you use copper because it's a bit easier to work with and less of those cracks. When you're working with the silver and you perhaps see a crack appear, what, how do you proceed from there? Do you have to just start over? Is there a way that you can fix the crack yeah. or just redo a certain part? Like kind of what happens once you find that? Yeah, um, finding a crack mid-project really depends on how early you locate that crack and where it is. If I'm working on a project that's, say, 30 rounds of hammering, and that crack happens in the first 10 rounds, I'm probably going to restart because that crack will only resurface and it'll continue to grow more. Maybe I'll be able to cut it out if it's towards the edge, but if it's in the center of the work, I can't really cut that out. I can try soldering things and it'll hold together, but every time I start to move that metal, the metal remembers that crack and it'll always pop back up again. If I'm on round 25 of a 30 round project, I'll try to make it work because I've already invested a tremendous amount of time. So I'll baby the next maybe five rounds or maybe I'll change the design so I'm not moving the metal as much. It really depends on when and where that crack comes up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from, from Zoom, we have a question. Have you ever tried to make a piece using the tools and heat sources 
that would have been available in antiquity, and I guess that means only the tools yeah. and heat sources that are available in antiquity. No, I haven't. I mean, I think it would be an amazing research project to be able to do that, but that would require a complete overhaul of my studio. It would require at least a year of gearing up on the research of the tooling. It, that project would be several years in the running, and um, anything that I made would take a lot longer without using the tools I'm accustomed to. So I don't know what the benefit would be. That was my follow-up. Can you think of, I mean, you're approximating, the techniques you're using are the same, you just have steel and propane versus bronze Charcoal, and coal yeah. or iron. So um, I guess the softer tools, different heat, You you, it would slow you down and add uncertainty in some ways? Yeah, it would just make my job even harder. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question here from... Uh, thank you for the presentation. It thank was you. really impressive. Uh, so I, wanna, I have like two questions and one comment uh, regarding the tools actually from excavations. In Bulgaria, we have bronze hammer from mm. the Iron Age. So obviously, yeah, they were using mm -hmm. hammers made of bronze. And uh, my quest uh, question is, um, so you are working only from outside, you are hammering only from outside? Generally, most of the work is from the outside, but there are some specialized tools that get on the inside and push stuff out. Those are a little bit dangerous to work with. Um, they are aggressive tools and they can make mistakes quickly. I just didn't have really good documentation of that. Usually, especially uh, on the silver work, when I get to that process, my head is so focused on what I need to do with the material and that technique, the last thing I think about is grabbing the camera, setting it up, getting a good camera angle, and filming it because I'm worried about the piece itself. But generally, I like working from the outside in. That way I can control the metal more. When you work from the inside out, you're really only stretching. So you're thinning that metal out and you can't always tell where it's thinning. Yes, because um, we can actually see from inside mm -hmm. two marks. Mm -hmm. So obviously they were also working inside as well. Yeah. And the other question was uh, about this formula. It's mm -hmm. easy, of course. But uh, sometimes on the fialas we have uh, like two centers. Mm. Do you think it was just a mistake or they were correcting somehow? That's really interesting. I would have to look at the piece and um, I don't, I mean, I have raised something with two centers. Uh, it was an exercise. You know, the piece that came out of it had two points on it, but a Fiali is usually a flat bottom, two centers. It's not oval, it's round still. Maybe they made a mistake. Maybe somebody accidentally punched it later on. Really have to look at that. But you Singly. can clearly see that they were aiming to do this. It's not. Oh, weird. Obviously, it was not a mistake. And in the same time, you have sem symmetrical form. You don't uh, need to have two centers. So it's you're going to have to send me that. Okay. I want to look at this now. <laughs> I, will. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have more questions on Zoom. But I want to follow up on this first question that Petra Pankova asked about you know, hammering from the inside, from stretching you know, to get the arms, you know, mm. or when we have the protomes, you know, the snout of a stag or mm -hmm. a horse, um, you know, that se th those seem to me visually to be the most difficult parts to achieve. And how much could you, how much of that can you do without going inside? And then how do you get the access inside yeah. These complex shapes, such as your EMU. Yeah, it's, I mean, I built specialty stakes to fit up into the arms of the EMU. And when I'm at a beginning raising point and you start to see this uh, mound in the front of the figure, um, that end of that mound is actually where the end of my arm needs to be. What's deceiving is that the rest of the body is a lot larger. So sometimes you're just getting a stake at that 
point of the mound and then you're hammering around a form and you're pushing everything else down. So you're maybe not actually stretching out, you're pushing everything down and stretching down a little bit. Um, it's hard to explain without samples and the actual tools because the tools are so weird looking. You know, they're not a straightforward, I mean, think of a couple of them actually were Allen wrenches, like very uh, thick Allen wrenches, three quarters of an inch. Um, and I rounded up the top of them. So it's making this very drastic 90 degree bend. But after a while, that doesn't even work. So I have other weird shaped steel implements that kind of reach up. And at some point, you can't get anything in there. And you hope you did everything prior to it correctly so then you can get the form that you want. Snarling irons are another thing. Um, and that's just a weird tool. Without an example, it's hard to understand. <laughs> Right, and we don't, do we have evidence for the use of the snarling irons in antiquity? I don't think so. I mean, they really rely on spring and that comes with steel, so. Yeah. Could, could you just briefly explain, you know. So um, a snarling iron, um, there are some images on my website of them and uh, actually on my Instagram, I hand drew this flip book at one point and at the very end of it, it shows a snarling process. And it's a right angle tool that's placed in a vise. And then there's another right angle which makes contact on the interior of your silver object. And you hammer towards the end of the device and the vibration transfers through the tool and pokes the metal up. It's a very slow process and it only stretches the metal but it's pretty amazing too. Yes, please. Um. Okay, I have another question. Um, this is about, I know that you said you stuck the two parts together using orthodontist wax. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else that you tried or attempted and what were the reasons that they didn't work or you just thought orthodontist wax would be better? Well, I mean, it, it has like a tension, fl uh, tension fit and then I actually chased in a little bit of a line. So it does click into place. So when you push that object down, you can hear an audible like snap. And then when you take it out, you have to be a little cautious because it takes more force than you'd think. And um, the problem was it fit fine. It wouldn't fall off. It wouldn't fall out if you tipped it upside down. It just wasn't watertight. And even if you buy two pieces of plumbing uh, materials, like an elbow and a straight pipe, and you stick them together and you put liquid in them, you know, those are machine made, but liquid finds a way out of anything. Uh, so the orthodontist wax just acts as like a little tiny binder to fill in any gaps that are in there. I tried an O-ring as well. So I tried to chase in a recess and put an O-ring around it and then put the protome over that O-ring. That didn't work. You know, I was thinking of everything, maybe wrapping leather or something, but I, in antiquity, I'm guessing they used wax or pitch once again, because you could just put a little pitch in there and it would be fine. Thank you. Um, we have several uh, comments of, of great praise for a clear and wonderful <laughs> and amazing uh, presentation. Two uh, that are similar uh, about was lost wax casting ever used to make right uh, or, or molds? Uh, yeah. to hammer over molds, which are yeah, I think similar we see, but different processes. Yeah, we see evidence of both in some examples. Um, I can't reference the exact works, but yes, there was some casting to just make right to, and also hammering over molds and then doing like two halves and then soldering them together. Maybe they were cast, maybe they're hammered, um, but they're usually heavier. And also the design style is different. Whenever something is hammered over or cast, usually you don't see as much um, like extension of the head or extension of the legs. It's more compact. And if you look at the weights on the description, you'll tell that it's a lot heavier object, definitely. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Um, my question pertains to this sort of process. You know? So you're, you're annealing and you're producing some kind of scale and then I assume you're pickling. And that scale, is that loss? And does your alloy change over these different steps? And if so, 
is that something that you can kind of feel? Like, is does the metal feel the same yeah. at the end as it does at the beginning, no matter how much you anneal it? Yeah. Um, so a couple things. When you do anneal, you're oxidizing the metal. So the surface of the metal is reacting. It's a chemical reaction. There's oxygen in the flame. There's chemicals in the flame as well. So depending on what type of fuel you're using to heat your work, uh, it's either a reducing environment or an oxidizing. Uh, copper builds up a very large amount of scale. So whenever I work copper, I then put it in a mild acid bath and it pickles or cleans the surface of that so then I can work. Fine silver does not oxidize that much. It's nice and clean all the time. I'll still dip it in the pickle just to make sure that I picked up no flux or something else from my uh, annealing pan. But I recently did a sample where I raised a cup in an hour. It's the fastest thing I raised. And I intentionally did it in fine silver because I didn't have the time to pickle. And you can just keep heating fine silver and working with it. You don't really see a change at all. It's just the thickness or the thinness of metal that you're really picking up on. Now, all your alloys, Britannia and Sterling, um, they'll do a process which is depletion gilding. So as you heat it, the fine silver will separate from that alloy and go to the surface of the work. So if I file into a sheet of sterling silver and I heat it wherever I filed, it will turn black because that's some of the copper alloy oxidizing differently. Where I did not file is fine silver and it'll stay nice and white. So the more I heat this through annealing, the more that layer of fine silver builds up. And for work that you're not soldering on, that's fine. You're just building up kind of this thicker surface of nice fine silver. But once you start soldering onto it, you have to be careful that your solder can kind of pull that fine silver layer away and you can have a failed solder seam. So you'd want to sand that back down or file that back down. We have a couple of questions from Zoom that follow up on these same lines. Uh, <laughs> Are you annealing and soldering using oxygen mixed with your propane or just straight propane? And do you use borane containing torch fuels? Oh man, wow. <laughs> that was from uh, Ma Master uh, Conservator John Twilly, who's visiting us on Zoom. So, All right. Yeah. Um, well, what I use is uh, propane and I get a propane tank from the local hardware store. It's the same one that you cook with your grill. I do that because it's cheap. It's like 15 bucks. Um, I hook it up to an ambient air torch, so it's a single fuel torch. It's just propane, and it's grabbing oxygen from the air. So I'm not adding a tank of oxygen to it. That would make that flame much hotter and more aggressive and adding more oxygen than needed for my process. So single fuel, just propane. I don't know how clean that propane is, but we also eat with it, so it's gotta be decent, right? <laughs> I have a question here in the auditorium. So I see um, one big difference between you and these original um, metal workers that, that you were um, illustrating. Back then, I imagine they were in inventing these new processes, like they were um, sort of developing new technology or emerging technology to sort of do this stuff. Have you considered 3D printing? Is that um, practical just to mention? Yeah, well, one thing is I don't think they were actually inventing that much. I think they're in a better position than I am now because it was a workshop that had multiple generations of people working in it. So somebody was actually teaching how to make these objects where I need to problem solve based on what I'm looking at. 3D rendering and printing, I think, is a great way to model and to understand what you're going for. But I don't understand how that will help me realize my hammering pattern, because I can push material to the front and grow that wall more than the back. It doesn't help me realize if my hammering stake has a deep enough throat and I can hammer correctly on it, or my object is too small for that stake doesn't help me realize my hammer doesn't have a long enough throat and I'll be hitting the handle with it once I get to this one point. So the work I do, I really try to focus on just handmade work and what is it 
that requires just my hand to make. You know, if it's a, a symmetrical bowl or cup, there's great spinning processes or deep drawing processes to create that vessel out of metal. And that's what industry uses. But to make something as complex as an EMU figure with arms requires me starting from the very beginning to methodically think about where that material is going. And I don't know of any 3D program that can assist me with that yet. Um, to follow up with the, the, the Getty has these antiquities. Have they scanned them and tried to re um, replicate them with 3D printing at all? Uh, uh, we, we have made 3D scans of some of them and we've x-rayed them. We haven't tried to, to print them out. Um, we have, in fact, for the Persia exhibition, uh, because everything in the museum, whether it's in our permanent collection or in the loan show, has to have a custom-made mount for earthquake. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of preventative conservation. We're in an earthquake zone. We'll know there, there, there are earthquakes, we just don't know when. Rather than waiting for an earthquake come and knock everything over and damage it, each piece gets a custom-made mount to secure it. And if you start looking from the sides or behind or underneath, sometimes you'll, you'll see these mounts. Traditionally, our mount makers would travel before the exhibition to the objects where they're being loaned, they'd measure them, and they'd make prototype mounts. So that would speed up the process of when the object comes to make an exact fit for the mount. Because of COVID in particular, travel was difficult before this exhibition and with emerging technologies. They've mm -hmm. done, not for the Rita, but for some of the bowls, 3D scans, which are more challenging with silver because mm -hmm. of its reflectivity, but 3D scans and made printouts, you know, which are a dull white, you know, plasticky epoxy thing, and use those printouts mm -hmm. to fabricate the mounts, which then limit the amount of handling the objects need for the mounting. So we have used them, but for this very practical purpose of rendering the mounts. Um, whether, say, the museum shop would ever want to make replicas for sale of objects, but I don't know if you could 3D print in metal. What you could do is you could create molds and then cast the replicas, but those objects would be very different than the work Adam does through hammering. They'd be thicker, less detailed, mm -hmm. etc. But the emerging technology is something that's being used by museums in the way I've described in others, I think. Um, I, I walked through um, the exhibit at the Huntington where they had all this you know, paper, and the curator explained that they were all um, um, fakes. The originals were all in the, in the, in the, um, you know, in the vault. And that what was Speak on, into the microphone, oh, please. And what was on exhibit was actually um, copies of all, everything else. And they just pretended they were the real thing. Um, mm. you know, for well, we, hope, we hope that everything we have on display in the villa is, is originally <laughs> ancient and not forgery. <laughs> You're not worried about someone stealing something? No, 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 we're not, we're not worried about the kind of uh, taupe copy caper thing where the replica is substituted for the original. I okay. think at least with, with the metal work, the, the, the technical qualities, the mm -hmm. weights, uh, and of course our security, we're competent of keeping track of the original. Um, uh, uh, one, one last question from, from Zoom. well, two, two, one just came in. Uh, one is similar to this. Does the age of the metal, Adam, make a difference? For example, if you were to melt Oof. down a 2,000-year-old silver vessel, why would you? But if you were, um, you, ha would that have different operating principles than new silver, or is it the annealing yeah. just makes it like new each time? I don't know. I've never had the option of working with very old silver, but I mean, if somebody has a very old bullion bar around and they want to donate it to me to hammer on, I could answer that question. But I, I, firsthand experience is the only way to determine if it would be different. I'm sure there was in past a lot of impurities in certain metals and no, I see <laughs> they were still good. They refined them to very high degree. Yeah, so I think it would be exactly the same. I feel like you can anneal something and then relax the metal. Like I could take something 2,000 years old, heat it up, and start shaping it again. <laughs> Getting excited here. <laughs>
Petya Penkova agrees with you that the, uh, the purity of the silver was the same and it would be similar. Uh, the last question, I think, uh, one... Second to last. We got one oh, more Oh, I'm last. sorry. Please, please go ahead. I didn't see you. Please. First of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation and sharing your knowledge. It's incredible. I am in awe of the EVA glove. Mm. I can't get my eyes off the <laughs> fold. And I'm wondering, did you have a picture? Do you have a real object? Were you looking at it? Or do you already... I, I admire it and I can't get my, off, my eyes off that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, if anybody's in North Carolina and you're in the Western North Carolina area, um, find your way to Penland School of Craft. You can visit my studio and whatever project I'm working on will have a whole bunch of images of actual pieces. I didn't have a glove. I found one on eBay and I was thinking about purchasing it, but it was pretty expensive. But uh, I, I looked at a lot of pictures and then I draw a lot as well. So I don't draw exactly what I'm gonna make in metal because I may not be able to make it exactly, but I draw to understand the object and what I like about it. So a lot of those wrinkles and folds are emphasized beyond what a normal glove would have. But I think it adds character to that piece and it adds who I am as a maker to it. So I appreciate you seeing it all. And again, prototypes for that whole piece. There's nine copper ones that came before the silver. So all of those, I'm testing that understanding of which way the material's moving and how it's bending. And some of those folds are not me putting them in with chasing repose. They're me compressing the object and the metal is folding at a weak point on its own. So that was a really fun thing to start to explore and to understand. I'm using the thinness of the metal to have it self collapse on its own. And it, it has a different look than what I can do with a chasing tool. Gorgeous, thank you. Thank you. So our last question I know is uh, one you and I have discussed, but <laughs> I'll, I'll let you answer. Have you ever had the chance to raise gold? I, I currently own like a little over a half an ounce of gold and I've raised it into what looks like a half ping pong shape. Um, it's very tiny and raising really small things is difficult because you can't hold on to them. It's not enough material to really get a full understanding. It is a project that I am looking into and I'm always, you know, putting feelers out. If somebody has some gold and would love a gold cup, get a hold of me. We can work out something. But the amount I really need to get a decent sized cup, and we're talking a cup like a little larger than this, is probably going to be 10 ounces of 24 karat gold which is, you know, right around 20 grand. Um, gold is extremely dense. So if I make one of those Sea Monster stirrup cups um, and gold, I'm going to need roughly two times more material in gold than silver. Uh, and you can work with alloys of gold as well, but that's the whole idea. I'd love to work with 24, 23, 22, 20 maybe 19 and 18, to just feel out how that material works, what I can do with it, how it compares to silver, how it compares to copper. It's a void in my understanding that I'm trying to find a way to fill, but it's an expensive material. So there's limitations. Let me know if you have a bar of gold. <laughs> well, thank you. With that, Adam, I want to thank you on the behalf of the audience here in, at the Getty Villa, our Zoom audience, uh, for a wonderfully illuminating presentation. And uh, we look forward to seeing what you're going to produce next. Thank yeah. you so very much. But also, for those <laughs> in the auditorium, again, please, uh, from 2.30 to 4, Adam will be demonstrating some techniques out around the corner and down in the education studio. And in the intervening moments, uh, you can return or go to the Persia exhibition on the second floor of the museum, see some of the wonderful mm -hmm. ancient uh, Raita and other pieces produced by craftsmen as early as the 6th century BC. And also there's a separate uh, display of two magnificent, mm -hmm. uh, slightly later silver Raita, a horse with inlaid garnets, and two embracing centaurs. Yeah. So uh, with that, thank you, Adam. We look forward to the demo and uh, your, your future projects. Thank you so very thank much. Thank you.